Thank you. And thank you all so much for being here. It's thrilling to see how much the community has grown recently. I'd like to talk a little bit about the growth we've seen in the Ray community. I'll say a bit about what makes Ray special, why it's emerging as the tool of choice for building distributed applications. And I'll talk a bit about where we're headed next. We've seen tremendous growth since Ray started its life as a research project at UC Berkeley several years ago. The number of contributors has skyrocketed from a handful of grad students working together to today we have over 350 contributors from 75 different companies. And to put that in context, you can take a look at other popular projects in the ML and systems space that have been around for similar amounts of time like Kubeflow, MLflow, Horavad. These are all very different projects and this gives some sense of the excitement in the Ray community. And importantly, these external contributions are not tiny contributions. We're talking about major features like adding support for new languages, adding a dashboard, major refactorings of the worker code, of the backend, support for additional cloud providers, and so on. So these are serious, serious contributions, often coming from companies with multiple people working to improve Ray. And that's something that we look at as a sign of a strong community. Another area where we've seen enormous growth over the past couple months is in the ecosystem sitting on top of Ray. Some of these are libraries that we develop as part of Ray. Others are third-party libraries that integrate with Ray. So two of the first libraries that we began building were RLlib for reinforcement learning and Tune for hyperparameter search. And today, these are among the most popular libraries for reinforcement learning and hyperparameter tuning. More recently, we began working on libraries for model serving, deploying models in production, and distributed training. These are at a much earlier stage, and you'll hear more about all of these different libraries throughout the summit. Of course, the really exciting part of the growth is the, what the growth we've seen in third-party libraries built on top of Ray. Hyperopt and Optuna, two of the most popular hyperparameter tuning libraries, both integrate with Ray Tune for hyperparameter search. Spacey and Hugging Face, Two of the most popular libraries for natural language processing integrate with Ray to scale up training to multiple GPUs and to tune and deploy your Hugging Face models. And you'll hear talks from both of these libraries. You can scale training with Horvod and PyTorch on your Ray cluster and use them with Ray Tune and Serve. And you'll hear more in the Horvod talk. Dask is a popular Python distributed system with a great data frame library. There have been some recent community contributions that allow you to run Dask applications on Ray and you'll hear more in the Dask on Ray talk. Some of the major cloud ML platforms like AWS SageMaker, Azure ML, integrate with RayTune and RLib for training and reinforcement learning. And you'll also hear from Weights and Biases, which integrates with RayTune, Selden, which uses Ray for massively parallel model explainability, Modin, and many others. So what we're seeing is that Ray is starting to become the go-to framework, not just for scaling Python applications, but for scaling Python libraries. And of course, the benefit here is not just that you can use one of these libraries, but rather that you can use them all together and pick and choose the state-of-the-art libraries and combine them together in a single application. So if you're a library developer and are interested in scaling your library with Ray, please reach out to us on the Ray Slack. We'd absolutely love to help out. So I'd like to illustrate this, illustrate the benefits in the case of Horavad from Uber, one of the most popular libraries for distributed training. So the benefits of integrating with Ray include being able to run Horavad on AWS, GCP, Azure, or Kubernetes using Ray, integration with Ray Tune for hyperparameter tuning, integration with the rest of the ecosystem. And this was all released in Horavad 0.20, which just came out. And the whole thing took around 400 lines of code to implement. And of course, this collaboration and many of these other integrations are at the very start, and there's a lot more work to do. But hopefully, this gives a sense of some of the early benefits. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about what makes Ray a great choice for building distributed applications and why all of these libraries are choosing Ray. I think it comes down to three things, the API, performance, and the ecosystem. So we already talked about the ecosystem and how anyone using Ray can immediately access a whole slew of state-of-the-art libraries off the shelf. So I'll say a bit more about Ray's API and performance. One question we get a lot is, how can Ray support so many different workloads, like so many different types of workloads? Isn't that impossible? To answer that question, let me describe how the core Ray API has progressed over time. 
the core Ray API has actually been quite stable. There have been three major developments. We started Ray with just remote functions, just the ability to execute Python functions asynchronously in a cluster. That's very powerful and supported a lot of workloads, but it wasn't quite enough to do machine learning. Then we added actors, so you could translate Python objects and classes to the distributed setting and support stateful applications. All of a sudden, that opened up a bunch of doors, and today, actors are the building block for most of the libraries built on Ray. But actors were still limited because only one caller could invoke methods on an actor. The third big, challenge we, the third big change we made was to introduce actor handles, so any actor or task could invoke methods on any other actor. And that made the Ray API as general as a lower level RPC framework and enabled the full diversity of applications that we have today. And those are the core concepts in the Ray API. That's how we support such general workloads. The answer is that our core API doesn't introduce new high level concepts like a data set or a neural network or a graph or anything like that. Instead, we take the existing concepts of functions and classes which we know are general enough to express all sorts of workloads, and we translate those into the distributed setting. And because the API is so general, that's what enables the ecosystem on top. Now, performance is another key factor that makes Ray a good choice for building distributed applications. If you're developing a library or application, it's not enough that Ray's API lets you express your workload. Of course, that's a necessary condition, but Ray also needs to be fast enough to support your workload efficiently. So performance is a key factor that enables generality. If you're building a system that supports a ton of different workloads, then your system inherits the performance requirements of all those workloads. So I'll show just two figures. The first is a latency measure for invoking a single task. Now, if you compare with a lower level RPC framework like gRPC, gRPC, gRPC takes around 220 microseconds. And if you do this with Ray, which actually uses the C++ implementation of gRPC under the hood. It's about 190 microseconds. So for Python developers, Ray outperforms gRPC. The story is similar for throughput, but in this case, Ray actually uses multiple gRPC channels to roughly saturate the network bandwidth. We can do way better here because gRPC is not built for large objects. So the takeaway is that if you're primarily concerned about performance, you don't have to build your own distributed system from scratch using low-level RPC frameworks. You can get the performance you need using Ray. So as Ray is becoming used more and more in production settings, stability and maturity has become an increasing focus. So today, we're announcing Ray 1.0. This is a huge milestone and achievement for the community, and it's the product of work from many, many people and companies. This indicates API stability for the core Ray API. It's the first step toward making sure that Ray is production ready and production scale. And it's the beginning of a serious commitment to the project's maturity and stability. We're excited for you to try it out and give us feedback. And if you're interested in getting involved and influencing the roadmap going forward, join our public Slack and chat with us there. We'll also be having office hours with the Ray developers and library developers throughout the summit. So be sure to join those. You can bring your questions or get help with your Ray application or just chat. I'd like to highlight a few different features in 1.0. A couple of them are related to the serverless experience and letting users reason about their application logic and not just and about the resources used by their application and not about servers. That's a critical uh, component for making distributed computing a friendlier user experience. One is related to stability. We talked with many users. And one persistent problem was how to reason about memory management in the distributed setting. That is now fully automatic and is a huge advantage in 1.0. For more details there, I'd recommend taking a look at the Ray architecture white paper, which is linked to from the Ray GitHub README. Two other developments are about increasing the set of users we can support. So the Ray Java API is now stable and ready to try out, and the core Ray API now supports Windows. So I'm not going to dive deeply into all of these points. I'm going to focus on just the first couple points about providing a serverless experience. So again, the goal here is to let developers reason about resources and not machines. The point of serverless autoscaling is to make sure that users don't have to configure their Ray cluster 
or say precisely how many M4 instances or how many P3 instances they need, or how to get the precise ratio of CPUs to GPUs. Instead, the Ray cluster will just add the appropriate instance types and scale up and down depending on what the application needs. So to illustrate the kind of applications that this can enable, imagine you're running some training. This is just pseudocode. And maybe your experiment needs a bunch of CPUs. And in fact, you have a lot of experiments you want to run. So if you run this code, you'll want Ray to automatically scale up the cluster to use tons of large CPU machines to run all of these experiments in parallel. And then when that's done, you want it to scale down and stop using them. Or maybe you, you, know, you run stuff requiring a bunch of GPUs. And maybe you even have a very specific kind of GPU that you care about. So Ray will automatically start the appropriate GPU instances to run your application. You don't have to worry about instance types, how many machines, what size they are. This all falls out of the application's resource requirements. So this is a feature that we hope will make running distributed applications way, way easier by getting rid of the cluster configuration. The second feature I want to highlight is placement groups. So placement groups allow atomic scheduling of resources across a cluster and enable things like affinity or anti-affinity placement. A placement group is basically a collection of resources that is atomically reserved, possibly across multiple machines. And new tasks and actors can be scheduled to run in that placement group or in a particular section of the placement group. For example, if some actors need to be co-located. You can configure the placement group to pack things together or spread them apart. And this is what it looks like if you want to schedule a task in the placement group. It's just an additional option to the normal task invocation. You can take it further and specify which section of the placement group the task runs in. So that's the API. It's a very flexible concept. And of course, there are a number of use cases we have in mind, and we're excited to see what people build with this. Looking forward, our goal with Ray is to make it as easy to program clusters of machines as it is to program on your laptop. We'll be doubling down on hardening and production requirements. That includes support for monitoring, tracing, metrics, great integration with Kubernetes. You'll hear more about this in one of the upcoming talks. And especially as Ray is being used more and more for production serving workloads, this is a critical focus. Scalability and performance are always on the top of our mind. There are a number of optimizations planned here, especially related to data intensive workloads. Ease of use encompasses things like ease of deployment on Kubernetes, improving the dashboards, tools for debugging distributed applications, and so on. And lastly, a big focus for us is on doing everything we can to support the growing ecosystem on top of Ray. We have a ton of work planned here, and that's something we're super excited about. So I hope you enjoy the Ray Summit. Thanks so much for being a part of the Ray community. This project you know, wouldn't be anywhere near where it is today without such a passionate and engaged community. And that's something we're extremely grateful for. If you're new to Ray or looking to get more involved, we'd love to have you involved. We'd love to have you influencing the roadmap. I'm looking forward to chatting with as many of you as possible throughout the summit. Chat with us on the conference Slack. You know, join the Ray developers at our office hours in the AnyScale booth. We'll be there throughout the conference. You can get notified when the talks are available through our YouTube channel. Thanks so much.